Good evening, friends, and welcome to another late night edition of Crime Time with Duty Ron and Ed Wallace. We are retired New York City police detectives, and if you like all things true crime related from the police detective's perspective, you're in the right spot. Hit that subscribe button, hit the notification bell, so you'll get all things Duty Ron and this guy over here, Ed Wallace, when we go live or upload another video. Tonight, we're going to get into Brian Laundrie's shocking phone call that was revealed over the weekend to his parents in the Gabby Petito Sybil case. We are going to get into it. I'm not surprised, Ed, but it is shocking to hear. Uh, how are you doing tonight and where are you? What's going on with you? I know you're in a, a, in a different location than normal. What's happening with you tonight, Ed? I'm doing great. Uh, I'm in um, Colorado, Rocky Mountain High. Oh, wow. Um, I'm, I'm in Mile High City. And Outstanding. Um, we got wind of this over the weekend, uh, and you know, a lot of people were sending messages into dutyround.com. I was getting them on my social. Hey, are you going to talk about this? Uh, Brian Laundry reaches out to his parents on August 29th uh, of 2021 and says, Gabby's gone, and I need an attorney. This is groundbreaking. This is like things that make you go home. I thought I knew everything about this case, but just hearing this to me is shocking because right away, my detective skills and my spidey sense goes right to criminal, <gasps> you know, aiding and abetting. But then we look at the Florida law and we're like, oh, they can't go after a, uh, yeah, it's, it's um, him. In Florida, yeah, it's the uh, the statute is um, accessory after the fact, yeah. And apparently, there is an exception for um, family members uh, to aid and abet uh, their loved ones that they knew committed a crime. But that's Florida, and you know we're not we're not lawyers, we're not criminal lawyers. But the 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 homicide occurred in Wyoming. And he was in Wyoming when he made the call to his parents. So he obstructed, the, the parents uh, obstructed governmental administration, um, possibly aided and abetted and committed uh, accessory after the fact to the law enforcement authorities in Wyoming. And we always suspected that something was, a, was, um, was a rotten in Denmark with this. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, we you know always suspect uh, you know suspected that the parents knew more than they were letting on and this confirms it. Yeah, and and uh, you took the words right out of my mouth Ed because we were jumping up and down. I think we have probably the most amount of videos on Gabby Petito. Uh you and I did deep dives from the forensic side with our anthropologist with Barbara Butcher, the legal medical death investigator. We had Ian Dodor from Australia, come on, the bug doctor. Uh, we had Larry Dobrin, Dr. Dobrin, uh, talked about the dentist uh, when it pertained to Brian Laundry. But you know, the thing of it is, is we were always saying as parents, if you have, my son brings home uh, his fiance and, and then he proposes to her and she's living in my home. And I know you feel the same way. And I know our, our special guest is going to feel the same way about this as well. And he comes back without her. After going out on this, you know, they went out in July of 2021, July 2nd, uh, New York to see a um, uh, Gabby's brother graduate high school and then across the country. But he comes back on September 1st. You're not saying where the hell is Gabby and you're not calling her parents. You're blocking her parents. Don't forget, Nicole Schmidt, Gabby's mother, was blocked on Facebook. She was blocked on her phone and she was blocked on every single method to communicate with, with Roberta Laundry, That is the most vile thing that you could do as a parent and as a human being. Like for me, I, I, I said this so many different times. Now this just confirms how much of, how shitty of people these, these guys are, uh, both of them. Right, um, and it also puts uh, greater context to the letter that she wrote to her, her son and told him to burn afterwards. We're gonna get um, into it, we're gonna get into that. Let me play just a little piece and then we'll bring in our special guest. I want to play this just to set up what we're going to be talking about. This is attorney for the uh, Petito and Schmidt family, uh, Pat Riley. Uh, he appears to me to be a great attorney uh, and he's fighting for their rights here in this civil case. So let's take a listen 
This is from uh, late last night. Joining us now to lay it all out is Patrick Riley. He is the attorney uh, for the Petito family. Uh, Pat, we appreciate, appreciate you being here. You know, I thought I knew the ins and outs of this case, uh, but, you know, my jaw dropped when this new information came out really over the weekend uh, involving what you allege the laundries knew and when they knew it, um, basically saying uh, that about two weeks before uh, Gabby Petito was reported missing, that Brian Laundrie had made a phone call to his parents saying that Gabby was, quote, gone and that he needed a lawyer. How were you able to, to discover this, Pat? Well, good evening, Brian. Thank you for the invitation this evening. Um, the deposition of Christopher Laundry and Roberta Laundry was taken back in October, as well as attorney Stephen Bertolino. And during that deposition for the first time, Christopher Laundry disclosed that on August 29th of 2021, he received what he called a frantic telephone call uh, from Brian, in which Brian disclosed to him that Gabby was gone uh, and that he needed a lawyer. So uh, that just confirmed what we had suspected uh, going back almost two years. So I'm thinking back to that time, Pat, and there is this search happening all over the country for Gabby Petito, an enormous amount of police resources all over the place. Everybody's looking for her. Um, and, and according to this new information that you're presenting, the laundries knew that she was gone. And, and I know this is now a civil trial, but I think a lot of people are watching this wondering, like, how is this not oh. criminal if they didn't come forward with that information? I mean, were they allowed to withhold that? Well, I'm not a criminal lawyer, uh, but I know that Attorney Bertolino has certainly taken the position that they had the right to remain silent. They don't have an obligation to disclose. So I don't know whether or not there are any, are any possible uh, criminal charges that could be brought against them at this point. But certainly in terms of the civil litigation, this is uh, very uh, big information for us. Yeah, and the laundries, uh, again, this all came out as part of the new filing, collected a $25,000 retainer to pay a law firm in Wyoming. Yet at the same time, uh, they were going public through their attorney at that time, releasing statements. There was one statement that said in part, on behalf of the laundry family, uh, it is our hope that the search for Miss Petito is successful and that Miss Petito is reunited with her family. That was September 14th. Um, August 29th is when you're alleging uh, that that he was told she was gone, that they needed a lawyer. Um, and I got to stop it just for a second, Ed, because that statement on September 14th makes it, it compounds this by so much because it's really, really showing what kind of people these, these laundries are, these dirty laundry people. And um, to put that statement out there, and I, I'm saying this as a parent, I'm not even saying this as a cop, that is just, vile on so many different levels because they had knowledge of what was happening. They knew yeah. the son came yeah. back without her and they knew that she was gone. Now, I don't doubt that they might try to backpedal and say, well, gone me means that she left him. It didn't mean that she was dead. You know, I, I could, if she left him, he wouldn't need a lawyer. Right. But I could see them uh, grasping at straws here and trying to backpedal. And we may right. see that. I'm the just, bottom line is they obstructed justice in Wyoming. All right. They aided and embedded their son. They kept him out of the hands of law enforcement, knowing that, he, you know, he, he com committed murder, um, you know, and the countless hours and manpower utilized to search for her. That, that should all be billed to the laundries. Yeah, right? I was be, thinking of that. They should be made to pay, pay for that. Not just in Wyoming, but also the exhaustive search. at, at yeah, Carlton, in Missouri. Florida as yeah. well. Yeah. Right. The Maya Kahachi, Kahachapi, uh preserve that, that was an unbelievable amount of manpower that had it cost millions of dollars all right let's let the rest of this play and then we'll get uh we'll get right with the show but there's so much to talk about here so i want to speed it up so are, are the statements really a big part of, of of the case here i mean were they intentionally trying to mislead people do you think <laughs> well the statement certainly is the is the focal point of this particular case it's really the only cause of action we could bring against christopher and roberta laundry and the import of the statements is it supports our allegation that at the time that they made the statement, hoping that Gabby would be reunited with her family, which to most people, I, I believe, would mean that she's going to be alive and it's going to be a happy reunion. 
at the time they made that particular statement, they knew that she was deceased and they had known that for about two weeks and kept quiet for that two week period, despite the pleas from the family to help find her. Um, and they chose to speak up and make that particular statement with knowledge that she was already deceased. Are you surprised, Pat, that Chris and Roberto Laundry were um, so forthcoming with this information? Because couldn't they have said, look, attorney client privilege, we don't have to tell you what was going on behind the scenes in terms of us talking with lawyers and that kind of thing? Well, it was an attorney client privilege for what Brian told them. Mm. Uh, there was, there's no privilege there. What they may have told attorney Bertolino could have been privileged, uh, but they waived the attorney client privilege in terms of their relationship with attorney Bertolino. So how do things play out? I mean, I know there's a, a trial date set, the civil trial for next year. Is there any chance of a settlement? I, I would imagine, I mean, the laundries don't want more information like this coming out. I mean, would you consider a settlement? We would consider a settlement, but it would have to be under the right terms, and, and no one has proposed proper terms or right terms for the family at this particular point in time. But a settlement is always a possibility. Interesting. Okay. So there you have it, Ed. Uh, a lot said there. Uh, Pat Riley, well-spoken man, and it seems like he's he's got this all under control. Um, so many different possibilities, but bringing us right up to speed, uh, civil defense attorney, our good friend, Melanie Little, uh, was gracious enough to take out the time. She did in a uh, live stream earlier and I had asked her to come live with me last night and I didn't go live because my good friend Joey Brooklyn was on and we don't do that. We don't step on each other. So Melanie, thank you for being here and giving us your perspective uh, based on what you heard there from Steve, uh, from uh, Pat Riley. What, what's your thoughts on this right out of the gate? Well, I think my thoughts are that they've just basically proven their civil case. It looks like it's going to be a slam dunk based on the information that they testified at, to at their own depositions. The yeah. civil lawsuit is for intentional and negligent infliction of emotional distress. Right. And they basically admit, or at least Christopher Laundry admitted to it in his deposition, which is what? under oath, which is sworn testimony. What's the angle? I mean, I know, Ed, you, you and I talked a little bit about this uh, in the green room. But like, what's what's the what's the advantage to uh, Roberta and Christopher Laundry to come out and 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 say that if they were silent the, during this whole time, wouldn't they have realized uh, and and through their own counsel that this would really be high, you know, really bad for their case? Um, well, there's really no strategy there, but they're under oath and they swear to tell the truth and whatever questions they're asked, they have to tell the truth about. Um, you know, Florida does not permit criminal charges against parents or grandparents of a defendant as an accessory after the fact. So, you know, listen, Florida is a great place to live if you want to aid and abet your child after they commit a murder in another state. Um, that's another matter. But as far as the civil case goes, they were swore to tell the truth. They told the truth. And, uh, you know, the jury is the finder of fact in this case. It's a civil case. So it'll go to a jury and the jury will determine whether or not the laundries knew that the statements they were making were false when they made them and that they were intentionally made to cause emotional distress to um, right. Petito and and Petito's and Gabby's mom. And what's the lawyer's liability here? Because he, uh, he, he, um, he crafted that statement and he knew. Yeah, he could have a problem too, you know, but that's, again, that's going to be a question of fact for the jury. You know, did the laundries... Uh, lie to their lawyer and tell him or, you know, but he knew because he, he, he hired that Wyoming defense firm. So he That's paid the retainer. So right. why is he hiring a defense firm before the remains are ever found if he didn't need a defense lawyer? Now he's not Brian. family. Could he be an accessory after the fact? Or does his position as an attorney there uh, on yeah. the retainer He's not, no, uh, yeah, I think that that would prevent that charge. And also remember they're in Florida, you know, they're in Florida. This is not, I don't, I don't see that extending to the attorney criminally. Could Wyoming? Because the, the attorney's criminally representing his client. I mean, representing his client. So that's could like saying like every lawyer who defends a client who's guilty could also be charged with something. You know what I mean? I, I don't think it would extend that far. Yeah, Here's but now. Go ahead. Go ahead, Andrew. But he, but he knows he committed this murder in Wyoming, and he's in Florida now. He, as an officer of the court, he has no obligation to. Um... 
Well, he's going to say that the statement that he made did not indicate that they knew that she was alive. They wanted her to be reunited. He, they were hoping that the, they would be reunited with their daughter. And he's so going to say, I didn't mean team. alive. Right. right. So why and hire a defense question team? And for a jury, right? Yeah. Again, but why hire a defense team in Wyoming? Right. Again, all questions for a jury to put together to say whether or not what they did and what they said was knowing that Gabby was in fact deceased and that that statement was made intentionally to cause the parents of Gabby Petito emotional distress. Intentional infliction of and negligent infliction. Yeah. yeah. And remember also that this is in a Sarasota County courthouse. This is the same county where the civil jury just awarded Maya Kowalski's family family two hundred and sixty one million dollars. So yeah. this is a very generous county. And on the heels of that Kowalski case, this case coming up next, the beginning of next year could be another huge verdict. Yeah, we're looking at uh, May of 2024, tentatively yeah. set. Um, I have a clip of Stephen Bertolino. That's the attorney uh, that, uh, again, he's a co-defendant in this civil case. He fought to have himself removed as a co-defendant and was denied. There's been so much uh, back and forth with, uh, as it pertains to Stephen Bertolino. I have uh, a video of Ashley Banfield interviewing him, and she asks some very specific questions. And he answers these specific questions. And in my eyes, and I just saw this tonight before we went live, he lied on national television to Ashley Banfield. And this, if um, the, the Petito and Schmidt's attorneys, the civil attorneys is really working hard, I'm sure that they have this in the hopper because I'm going to play this right now and you guys could take a listen to it. It was surprising. It was shocking for me to hear this. And kudos to Ashley Banfield. You don't hear me say that much. But she did a great job of really cornering him. This is a 42-minute video, but in the first few minutes of it is when he incriminates himself. And listen closely, guys. A whole new chapter in this saga began. I'll set this up and just give you the dates on this so everybody that's paying attention and watching. It is from um, two years ago, October 22nd, 2021. The questions that have been so confounding. Why did Brian leave his fiance in Wyoming? What was his state of mind before he left home for the reserve? And what, if any, role did he play in the death of Gabby Petito? Fortunately, I'm joined by the man who has a lot of those answers, possibly, the attorney for the Laundry family, Stephen P. Bertolino. Mr. Bertolino, thank you so much for joining us. I know um, that you've known the family for decades, so this is an emotional time for them, probably for you as a friend, uh, but you're also you know, their attorney, so I'm, I'm very thankful that you're here to answer questions on their behalf. And I'd like to just start with the simple. When did you become involved with the Laundry family as their attorney pertaining to this particular case. Yes, good evening, Ashley, and thank you for having me. Um, I would say that was on September 11th. So you didn't speak with Brian or Roberta or Chris between September 1st, when he arrived back in Florida, and September 11th, 10 days later? I can tell you I didn't say that. What I can tell you is any conversations I had with Brian, Chris, and uh, Roberta uh, would be privileged and confidential. Um, what you asked me was when did I become involved for, for this particular case, and it was on September 11th. As we know and from that sworn affidavit that we're going to read in a few minutes, that is a big eh. no, that's not true. And this was, again, in October of 2021. This gets a little bit better because she continues to press them here. So I'm happy that she did this. So then presumably before September 11th, if you had conversations with them, say September 1st to September 11th, those 10 days, those would not be privileged because you hadn't been retained as counsel? Well, that's not true either because I've been the laundry family attorney for you know, well over 20 years. So any conversations I have with them with respect to legal matters would be privileged and confidential. Did he cover himself there, Melanie? Yeah, I mean, any, if you're, anytime you're talking to an attorney, if you have an ongoing relationship with them, whether you've paid them a retainer for that specific case or not, all communications are privileged. So yeah, he's correct about that. 
But why did they send him a $25,000 retainer before September 11th? They sent that to him on September 2nd. Didn't they send that to him for the Wyoming attorney? Yes. Yeah. Right. That's so he why. had to be in contact with the family before September 11th. Well, he was in contact with them. I think he just said that he wasn't retained. He didn't sign, meaning he didn't sign, he didn't sign a retainer. On, on August 29th, when Brian Laundrie called his family and said, I'm in trouble, that mm -hmm. friend to call, right. they said they called him right. on August 29th. Mm -hmm. And then they sent him $25,000 to retain him as a criminal defense attorney. And he acted from New York because he knew that he couldn't represent him while he was in Wyoming. Mm -hmm. He called Wyoming and he said, hey. And then he also called the public defender's office to see if he can get him a free attorney. Right. Um, so he he was not being straight up with the questions that Ashley was asking that clearly. But I think I think I think as an attorney, especially you know someone like he's very careful choosing his words. He chooses his lying. words very because, carefully because he's lying. Anyways, let's let the rest of this play. Um, I don't so like him when at all. Brian came home to Northport on the 1st, as is evidenced by a card reader, a license plate reader, seeing the white van coming home. How did you have your first engagement with the family? Was it, was it a family meeting? Was it a, a, a conference call? Like, how did you first connect with them after he had, uh, had, had returned? Again, any conversation I've had with uh, Chris, Roberta, and Brian, you know, was by telephone. But, uh, you know, the dates and what we discussed uh, are all attorney-client privileged and confidential. And, you know, I'm sorry to say that uh, I, I can't speak about those things. Counselor, I fully understand uh, that you cannot reveal those uh, privileged engagements, uh, the content within. I'm just sort of going around the, the contours of it, if you'd allow me to. And that is that I'm just curious about, because you're, as I understand it, I'm, I'm talking to you in Long Island, correct? That's correct. And, and the laundries have always been in Northport. No, they haven't always been in Northport. They lived on Long Island for many years. Uh, I don't know exactly how many years they've moved down to Florida. Sure. But, uh, Understand. I, I just mean for the purpose of this particular engagement, say from September 1st on, you did not go to Northport uh, to engage with them. You, you really had to do this from afar. That's correct. Uh, everything uh, has been, you know, by telephone, text message, or um, how should we say, uh, FaceTime. Or, or, or sort of these, these group Zooms. Did you have like the family, you know, group uh, FaceTime or the group Zoom like this? No, we didn't. We didn't do something like that. Conference calls? We've had a couple of conference calls, yes. And when you had the conference calls, I mean, I'm just thinking of myself as a mother. Um, and if my son were, you know, engaging with our attorney, it would be difficult. And I was curious about how Mrs. Laundrie's reactions were, how she was digesting. And again, you don't have to tell me what you were discussing. I understand that's privilege. But just the, the reaction, the nature, and the, the, the sort of uh, taking all of the information in in real time, how did she manage that? You know, Ashley, I, I don't want... I, I'm going to stop it here, but uh, we, we get the idea. I mean, he he was protecting his clients, and I get that. I get it. But now it's coming full circle that um, he he was contacted in August. And and Ed, that's the question that I had for Pete. We were going to have Pete Krusko, um, you know, criminal defense attorney. Now he was a prosecutor and he was also a federal prosecutor. And I had the question, you and I were talking about it today. I didn't get a chance to mention it to Melanie, but if Brian Laundrie committed this murder, uh, as he, we know he did in Wyoming and then crossed state lines to Florida and drove back with Gabby's van re returning on September 1st, that's where you know the FBI gets involved when you commit a felony and you cross state lines. It becomes uh, sometimes uh, the feds take over. You know, it's a now you could be charged federally, uh, and we know for a fact that the FBI was involved in this case for that particular reason, and also the credit card charges. He was using a credit card uh, at the, at his stops along the way. So not only did he murder her, but he used her credit card after the murders to get him, him, himself home. 
what's the chances that the FBI steps in here and says, oh, wait a minute. Ed, I mean, you and I talked about it today a little bit, but it's well, there is a federal, outreach. there is, a, there's also a federal charge of accessory after the fact, and there is no um, family exception to it uh, on the federal government level, from what I've uh, researched. But uh, the odds of them stepping in, I don't see it. Yeah, I asked that because everybody was asking. Uh, I saw some people in the chat say it, and you know, I wanted to get your take, Melanie, on that too. I know that you, you know, you're on on the civil side, but you're, you know, experienced trial attorney, and yeah. you, you talk to friends. You have to have friends. Like, what what would you think the thoughts of that? I would mean, be? I just don't see it extending to the parents. You know, just because their child may have done a federal crime by crossing state lines, I don't see that extending criminally to the parents who did not leave the state of Florida, right? In order to assist or aid after the fact, right? Do we have any evidence that they left the state to do that? Or did every, what, if they were accessories after the fact, did all of their acts occur in the state of Florida? I think they did. Yeah, that's, but the federal that's crimes, the, wouldn't hmm? the federal crime supersede the state um, exception? Yeah, but I don't think that they would extend to the parents, right? Well, because mean, the crimes were, the son did the crimes. And this, if the parents went out of state and crossed state lines to aid and abet, then I could see it extending to the parents. Right. So they took him in the camper and took him outside of the state of Florida. Yes. Right. Uh, but we know for a fact that, that they went into the, um, we, they went for that Kumbaya camping trip, right, for two days. Mm -hmm. And um, then mysteriously, they went into that park into Fort DeSoto, I believe it was. And then when they left, they were minus Brian Laundry, And they actually went back to that park to get his, um, his Ford Mustang because they were worried about it getting ticketed and towed. So they knew that he wasn't coming back for that car because they went and got it themselves and brought it home. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's where this whole thing goes south. I have a timeline that I want to show quickly for the viewers. And this kind of breaks down like what happened in the movements of Gabby Petito and Brian Laundry, and also what his family did. I think this will set up the next set of our uh, part of our conversation. So I want to play this and we'll come right back. Pito never goes outside. <laughs> July 2nd, 2020. Exactly one year before a life-changing road trip would begin, Gabby Petito and Brian Laundry announced their engagement online. On Instagram, a picture of their first date. Gabby writing, Brian asked me to marry him, and I said yes. One day later, Brian posting, Till death do us part. I'm so happy the answer was yes. Then there was the van. The 22-year-old and 23-year-old purchasing a vehicle to take them across country. A white 2012 Ford Transit van. New van means new adventures. And it would all begin on July 2nd, 2021, from the hamlet of Blue Point in Suffolk County on Long Island, where Gabby and Brian were visiting her parents celebrating her brother's high school graduation. July 4th, on the road in their new home, outfitted for camping and cooking, the couple snapped photos at Monument Rocks in Scott City, Kansas. Then to Colorado. Two nights at the campsites at the Great Sand Dunes National Park and Reserve with sand surfing. Next up, Utah. After leaving Colorado and getting stuck in a dust storm, the couple spent three nights in Zion National Park, hiking and pitching a picture-perfect campsite. From Zion to Cedar Breaks National Monument to Bryce Canyon National Park. The couple taking pictures and videos near the edge of the cliffs. I love the band. A few days later, Gabby posting photos from Mystic Hot Springs. Then hiking barefoot through Canyonlands National Park. After that, 12 days go by with no posts. Thursday, August 12th, Gabby posts photos from a trip just days before, a hike around the delicate arch at Arches National Park. Gabby noting she waited in a short line for someone to take their photo. Later, camping in Devil's Garden. But August 12th, things would take a turn. Currently doing 45 miles an hour, 
zone through here is 25. Oh, subjects just hit the curb. Officers called to reports of a disorderly conduct encountered Gabby and Brian in Moab City, Utah. What's you guys' names? Gabby. I'm Brian. Gabby, Brian, okay. Brian tells police Gabby got frustrated because she was trying to start a blog. She had been working on it for hours. He says they got into a fight when he got in the van with dirty feet. She just got uh, worked up because we were trying to get going and get our day going because we want to go uh, like for the center of the time. Gabby explains to officers she has anxiety and OCD. Some days I have really bad OCD. Brian is determined to be the victim and pleads with officers to not press charges. I'm fine, and I love Gabby. I, I hope she doesn't have too many complaints about me. <laughs> Police ask the two to separate for the night. They take Brian to a hotel and give Gabby the keys to the van. The next day, Brian posts photos tagged in Arches National Park and then in Moab. A week after the altercation, Gabby posts, but it's unclear where the couple is in terms of location. She also posts her first and only YouTube video for her blog. It appears to chronicle the couple's relationship and travels. On August 25th, Gabby posts her last Instagram post, writing, Happy Halloween, posing with a pumpkin in front of a mural outside The Monarch, a venue in Ogden, Utah, north of Salt Lake City. And then there's this. Jen Bethune says this video was taken in Teton County on 27th August around 6 p.m. And it shows a van that looks identical to Gabby's, but police have not confirmed it is hers. Two days later, on the 29th of August. My boyfriend and I picked up Brian. A woman claims to pick up a hitchhiker from Coulter Bay Village, south of Grand Teton. I want to just say something. A lot of people thought that this girl was full of crap. And I think now she was not full of crap. And, um... There was two or three others. There was, a to I think, a total of three people that picked up Brian Laundry. One woman was going to her Bible study or church, and she brought him back to the Tetons, and he didn't want her to bring him all the way down the dirt road where that van was. And I think that he, in my opinion, left and was hitchhiking to go shower himself and clean himself off. Because when you're out in the middle of the wilderness, you can't do it. You need to go to these little rest stops. And where she and her boyfriend picked up Brian Laundry was one of those stops where you could take a shower. Um, and, and I think that's what he did. And I'll, I'll get to Ed on that when we come back. But this girl here was, I mean, what she says in her full TikTok, which I'm going to play, was pretty powerful. And it's the 29th when they picked him up. So remember, that's when the... That's when he made that phone call to his family saying, she's gone. I need a lawyer. He approached us asking us for a ride because he needed to go to Jackson, which we were going to Jackson that night. This happened about 5.30 p.m. After seeing social media videos, she now identifies that person as Brian. I'm hoping this can help someone identify him. On August 30th, Gabby's mother receives a text from her daughter, but believes she didn't send it. I just believe she's in danger because I, she's not in touch with us. And she could be alone somewhere. She could be stranded somewhere in the wilderness. And she needs help. Two days and more than 2,300 miles later, on September 1st, police say Brian arrives in Northport, Florida with the van, but without Gabby. She's reported missing by her parents on Long Island on September 11th. That same day, the van is processed for evidence at the home the two shared with Brian's parents. Brian does not talk to the police or to the FBI. Then on September 15th, Brian is named a person of interest in the case. The police chief of Northport pleading with the Laundry family to speak to them. At the time, they do not realize it, but Brian is not at home. The next day, two people went on a trip, one person returned, and that person that returned isn't providing us any information. Police and Gabby's family begging for the Laundry family to speak up. We beg you to tell us. As a parent, how could you let us go through this pain? The Petito family even pens a heartfelt letter to Brian's parents. As a parent, how could you put Gabby's younger brothers and sisters through this? That evening, Brian's sister is speaking exclusively with Good Morning America. Obviously, me and my family want Gabby to be found safe. She's like a sister and my children love her. And all I want is for her to come home safe and sound and this to be just a big misunderstanding. Then on Friday, September 17th, 
The Laundries call police to report Brian is missing. They claim they last saw him Tuesday the 14th. He said he was going to the county park. The family attorney says they searched for him there on Wednesday, then drove his Ford Mustang back to their home on Thursday morning. However, Eyewitness News has confirmed Laundry's car was back in the driveway on Wednesday. On Saturday, there were dual searches for two missing persons. Authorities scour the massive 25,000 acre county park known as the Carlton Reserve, north of the Laundry family home in Florida, to no avail all weekend. Across the country, the FBI, the National Park Service, and local law enforcement agencies search the mountainous terrain of Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming. Search it for clues about what may have happened to Gabby. Then on Sunday, the heartbreaking news. Full forensic identification has not been completed to confirm 100% that we found Gabby but her family has been notified of this discovery. Authorities say law enforcement agents have found a body and they believe it's Gabby. Just heartbreaking, you know? We covered this case so extensively and, and I wanted to show that because it, it started from beginning to end. And Ed, you and I, uh, remember you remember when that that FBI agent gave that press conference? He got very emotional, and um, we that's when just things started going full speed ahead, and, and and our coverage was just daily on this case. Um, so I I, I, I want to go Ed to you because you brought up about these searches, and at the end there, that showed both the searches in the Tetons and back home in Florida. And that arguably could have cost millions of dollars in man hours, overtime, equipment, the dogs. We saw the canines. Um, do you, the drones, the aviation units. Absolutely. Yeah, it was just nonstop. But Ed, we saw the FBI inside the laundry home in Northport coming in and out with bags. And we never got to hear about any of that evidence because he killed himself and the case was over. Um, this civil people have to understand this proceeding and melanie you could talk about this it's a civil proceeding it has nothing to do with any criminal and there's so many people uh that say that the, that their pe people should be held accountable for this this should be the criminal investigation should continue but once you have the perpetrator who killed himself uh when he once once that happens everything's over the warrant gets canceled the arrest warrant gets canceled. All investigation pretty much stops. But in the civil case, it seems like we're teetering on this criminality. And people are in the chat. They're going crazy. I don't know if you see it, but everyone's like, you know, the sisters knew about it. The mother knew about it. The father knew about it. Where do we draw the line here? And where does this go from here? What is Pat Riley's um, uh, involvement? He just said uh, to Brian Enton, I'm... I'm I'm not a criminal defense attorney. I'm not a criminal attorney, so I don't know. Um, but we never got any answers. Nobody really spoke about where this thing could go. Uh, I think that he's concerned and concentrating on what his task and what his job is, and that's the civil case. Correct, Melanie? Yeah, that's all he's doing. The only thing that he can do for that family is to get them money damages. That's it. Nobody can bring Gabby back. Nobody can turn the clock back. The only thing this civil lawsuit is designed to do is to you know, to get money for the family, to get a judgment, to get some kind of an award. I don't know if there is uh, any insurance to cover this claim. Typically, their homeowner's insurance would cover something like this if it was pled in the negligence, uh, a negligence cause of action, which it looks like it is. I'm looking at the third amended complaint, which was just filed on November 30th. Um, and Bertolino is no longer a defendant in this complaint. So I don't know if he was dismissed from this case, if he was, if he settled, he's not a named defendant um, unless they have a typo because he's not in the caption, but he's in the first paragraph. I think he may have been dismissed from the case or settled. But as far as I, as far as I know, he's still a co-defendant in this case. And, and I, last I heard was in September, he put a request in uh, through his attorneys to have himself removed from the case and the judge denied it. 
unless something happened after September. But, you know, that's for another show. Uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm looking at it. It was just filed on November 30th. That doesn't list him as a defendant in the caption of the case, which is either <laughs> legal malpractice or, you know, there's this is the third amended complaint. Right. So this is the, and they're amending it to include all of the things that they learned during that October deposition, saying that this is what they said. And here's the timeline so that they have these facts in their complaint. What? So, Melanie, if I may ask a question. Mm -hmm. um if if the if they're going to go through insurance homeowners insurance wouldn't the insurance company's lawyers be involved well uh, who is the defense firm in this case do we know that they're not working for an insurance company let me who's the, who's representing the laundry fan and the in the civil suit yeah it's, it's pat, um, riley. pat riley is uh no, pat riley is the plaintiff's the, lawyer yeah, right um he's representing the petitos so yeah, yeah. right so, so the defense attorney is somebody named Ryan Gilbert. Gilbert, yeah. And also, and then there's two firms that were listed for Bertolino. But again, he's not in the caption of the third amended complaint. So um, they're going to have to file a fourth amended complaint if he's still a defendant because this is just indicating that he's not. So it's um, there's a lot of typos actually in this complaint, which you know <laughs> bothers me to no end. Yeah, and if they're going after the lawyer, they would be going after his insurance as well, right? Right. That's why I, I'm. he may have settled out. His carrier may have paid. If it was a malpractice claim, he definitely has insurance for that. He should have insurance for that. You have yeah, to have errors, errors in admission and malpractice. Well, you have a legal malpractice insurance carrier. Yeah. Um, but as far as who Ryan Gilbert is that represents the family, he may be assigned counsel by an insurance company. I don't know. Yeah. I want to go to some of these super chats and some of the people who are members. Brenda Th Starr, thank you for being a member for two years. Uh, every hey, everybody, peace. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Cheryl, thank you for gifting a membership. And Jeff Litweiler, him and his um, his great wife, his beautiful wife, Eileen, she just celebrated a birthday. So happy belated birthday again to Eileen. Uh, Jeff sends in a super, uh, super sticker or super chat, and she says, hey, Ed, come up to the hill to Wyoming. Highway 25. He wants you there, Ed. And he wants uh -huh. both of us there, actually. Um, thank you for being a member for 24 months. Uh, thank you for all you've done for Gabby. I hope and pray for her parents that they find the answers they deserve. They so deserve that they can find peace in this tragedy. Let it be. Amen. You know, Gabby's mom and and, and I met them at the golf outing. In, in Ed, you and I were there. That was in 2021, I believe. Uh, and we had a great time with them and we spoke with Joe Petito. I actually did an interview live on YouTube with Joe Petito and he talked about domestic violence and he was just so, you know, he was so willing to talk, uh, and to talk about his daughter. Uh, so, you know, these are great people. And, and we, we met the artist who did the Gabby Petito mural out in blue point, uh, Tess Parker. We had her on as well. And that was a great day. It was a great day. And they just recently did one up in Tampa. Uh, Kat, thank you for the $10 super chat. She says that Melanie, what about cleaning? Of, what about the cleaning of the van by the parents and Brian? Once he got back, can any charges be brought for destruction of evidence since they knew Gabby was murdered at this point? I think that may even be, I'll let you take that because it was directed at you, but Ed, you'd have a lot to say about that. Well, I think the question is about the criminal charges for, I mean, th he can talk about the evidence because they'd have to show that she was perhaps killed in the van, which may not be true, right? We don't um, know. We don't know. So we don't know. But um, according to Florida statute 777.03, which is the definition of accessory after the fact in Florida, it says any person not standing in the relation of husband or wife, parent or grandparent, child or grandchild, brother or sister, so all of those categories of people are excluded from being able to be charged as accessories after the fact okay. in a felony. Yeah. So I don't think so. I think that would, it's just Florida law. So now Ed, the chances of that van getting completely scrubbed and cleaned because it went right into the garage, uh, September 1st caught, um, Plate readers got, got them coming into Northport, Florida, it back, you know, backed into that garage. And then September 11th, Gabby's mom calls Suffolk County PD, a very astute detective in uh, Suffolk County, immediately contacted Northport and sent um, uniforms over to the Petito house in 
um, uh, uh, to the laundry house where Gary Petito was living in Northport, Florida, and they searched, or they, uh, it says they seized that vehicle. Uh, but that's a whole 10 days. What could be done there in 10 days? We've seen many people clean vehicles, a.k.a. Uh, Ryan Kohlberger and many, many others who've done their clean Yeah, 10 days after the fact, um, and there was information that the family and uh, had gone through the van and removed things and so forth. Um, you know, the evidence destruction it had already occurred if there was any evidence to begin with. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's just this, this whole case is troubling, but again, we're at the civil trial and we hope that the, the family, you know, and, and they say that anything that they get, and, and there was somebody in the chat, I think beautiful Miss Bell, uh, Miss Ball here says that Melanie Little and Duty Ron and uh, Ed, Steve settled for an undisclosed, uh, undisclosed amount, I guess, to be excluded from it. They accepted it and got them out. I had highlighted that. So yeah, any mm -hmm. settlement would be confidential. There may have been a confidentiality agreement signed, but the fact that I do not see his name in the caption of this third amended complaint indicates to me that he was let out. So Dirty Bertolino got out off, well, we don't know if he got off easy, but he got out. So We think, I mean, based on Beautiful Messy Ball said that a couple of times, I, I did look, I haven't seen it really reported, but it, it's yeah. quite possible it might not have been reported. Tomorrow morning, I'll try to send a message to um, JB from WFLA now. He's following the case closely. Hey, I wanted to, because we're getting close to the hour, I wanted to go to the burn after reading letter, Ed. Um, so we were all, you know, that was another thing that was, had us in, you know, in an uproar. Roberta Laundry um, wrote this letter to her son, and she alleges that she wrote this letter before they went out on this tour with the with the van and went on the their road trip. Um, the wording in this letter does not, and I'm, I, you know, like I don't buy flood land in Florida from anybody. I'm not, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not stupid. So like for me, I look at this, this letter and I say to myself, the wording in this letter about I'll bring a shovel. If you, you know, you need, you know, if you need to you know, garbage bags and a shovel, um, you know, ridiculous, things in this letter that she pens to her son i mean a baker a baker cake with a file in it yeah so you can get out of prison to break you out of prison i mean i have it up on the screen here but i'm going to save everybody the pain of that but ed uh we we did a, a live stream dedicated just on this on this letter mm -hmm. and it's not going to bode well against her especially now with this new uh affidavit that she swore out and melanie you're a mom of five um, the action of the laundries and, I, and, and listen, I know that we, we're all being critical here, but there's so much damning evidence now, especially after this came out uh, over the weekend, what parent would do something like that? I mean, they have to be some really evil, like ice water in their veins kind of people. And I wanted to just get your take on it because I never outright asked you how you feel about what the laundries did to the Petito and Schmidt family. Well, yeah, I mean, we talked about her burn after reading letter on a live stream that I did with you. I mean, you may, we may be thinking of the same show. Um, I found that letter repulsive. I said, I, you know, no matter what any of my sons ever did, I would never tell them that I would bury a body for them or, you know, put a file in a cake. I found it to be incredibly um, just very weird. It was almost the way it was written almost was like a letter to a lover. You know, it was really, really bizarre and inappropriate in a lot of ways, not just saying that she would help him conceal all of his, his crimes. But, you know, as a mother, this horrifies me, what they did. I think morally on every level, it was wrong. What they said, the statements that they made, the, the blocking of Gabby's family on all social media, not responding to text messages and phone calls or FaceTime calls, just to give them some information about where their daughter was or that she even wasn't in Florida. Just the whole thing was morally reprehensible. A hundred percent. As a lawyer, I have to tell you that there's a difference between a moral duty and a legal duty. And they are not the same thing all the time. Did they have a legal duty to tell the family where she was? No, not under the law. As a human being, yes. And sometimes those two things are very hard to reconcile. Yeah. Especially if your moral compass is so far off. 
Yeah. Okay. If that would have happened to, I know Ron and I, you know, we're law enforcement. Have we told my son, turn yourself in? We'll get you an attorney. Let's go. Turn yourself in. Right. We need to talk to your, your fiance's parents. That would be, you know, first and foremost, we have to keep Mm -hmm. her parents updated and, 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 her remains could have been recovered so much quicker than having to rely on. And we had them on with us, Ed, Jen and Kyle Bethune from Red, White and Bethune. Um, you know, you're a hype couple now is the name of their channel. Um, but they, if they hadn't taken that GoPro video and, and, and Kyle thought the GoPro was off, he didn't even know he was filming. Um, and someone from their Facebook group said, Hey, check your footage. You were in, you were in the Tetons and they went back and thanks to that Facebook user, they were able to get the footage and they immediately sent it to the FBI. I mean, we had yeah. them on with us. Yeah, and that was the hand of God right there. Major League. And as a matter of fact, we had Bill Cannon on with us with them. It was me, you, Bill, and, and the Bethunes, Ed. Remember this? Yeah. And Bill started crying. Mm -hmm. He said to them, you were an, sent, you were an angel from, you know, up above. God sent you to take that video. And that was a really emotional live stream. Um, I, I want to go to the chat because I think it's fair that we, you know, we spent 51 minutes here and we haven't gone to the chat. So hashtag Melanie, hashtag Ed Wallace, uh, just do hashtag Ed, hashtag Ed, uh, Melanie, hashtag duty Ron, put your questions in. I see Smitty is in the chat. We had a great meeting with Smitty on Sunday, me, Joey Brooklyn, Diane, my neighbor across the street. We broke bread with Smitty. She came in from Missouri. Hope you got uh, had a good time uh, in New York City. She was stayed in Times Square, so first time in New York City, she stayed at a hotel in Times Square. She got the full experience. Um, some pretty funny stories. Thank you, Schmitty, for being here. Uh, let's look at the chat and see what we got. People are saying change the law. <laughs> um, True crime with Shane says they knew Florida law, which is why they were very cocky in the way that they moved ab around all in the yard, moving the, uh, the lawn as if nothing was going on. Yeah, the father was mowing the lawn. I think that's, yeah, that's what he's saying, mowing the lawn. Absolutely. Ed, I see you work in the chat. You got one? Nope, nope, nope. He's just looking. Um, here's Crime Solver, uh, hashtag Ed, hashtag Melanie, hashtag Duty Ron. Why would they tell the truth now if they lied all along? I said that to Melanie. Is it guilt or is it their, uh, to their advantage somehow? Or are they just are trying to be honest, as Melanie said, that they're, on their well, oath, and they have to tell the truth. Ed, go ahead. That's it. That's it. I mean, the other stuff they couldn't be charged with. So right. per perjury in sworn testimony, they can be charged with. Yes. So. No. Yes. Yeah. yes, and it could come out. That law firm knows when they got the retainer, right? Yeah. They know. There's people that know. So it's not There's like it never come out. Yeah. There's a record. Monies have been exchanged. Right, right. And I have the affidavit up on the screen here. I mean, I could pull it up and put it on. Um, hold on. Let me see if this will come through. Can you guys see this? If it were all on here, I try to blow it up as big as I can. I just don't want to make it. That's too much. Um, so what was it? What did I say? Line 19 and 20. Uh, so line 19, um, uh, let's go with 17. The cause of Gabby's death was blunt forced injuries to the head and neck with manual strangulation. She was 22 years old at the time of her death. After Brian Laundry murdered Gabby Petito, he sent text messages back and forth between his cell phone and Gabby's Gabby Petito's cell phone in an effort to hide the fact. Remember that whole ruse that he was trying to do and saying that, uh, then texting her mom from her phone saying, oh, I want you to check on Stan. That's the grandfather. She never referred to him as Stan. On August 27th, 2021, it's believed that Brian sent the text to Nicole Schmidt where he referred to Gabby's grandfather, like I said, a Stan, and she knew that that was bullshit right away. She said it, she didn't say it like that, but she said, I knew that there was something wrong. On August 29th, Brian Laundrie advised his parents, Christopher and Roberta, in a frantic telephone call that Gabby was gone. Now, we can interpret gone as dead, or, and this is what I have, like, thoughts in my mind, and I'll ask Ed and, and Melanie again to chime in on this, could they, could she turn around and say, no, that's not what, that's not what we took it as. We, we took it as that she just took off and left and he needed an attorney or she fell off a cliff or she, 
hurt herself and they s split up. I, I don't see how they could do that, but there's people in the chat and there's people who sent me messages. Maybe they're going to try to weasel out of this thing and say, well, we didn't mean, didn't mean that she was dead, but gone and he needed a lawyer. And Ed, you brought that up. If she's just gone, why the hell would he need a lawyer? Right. And if she was just gone, why did she leave her vehicle with him? Yeah. I just want to chime on this for one second, because I think that you said that this is an affidavit. This is not an affidavit. It's the verified complaint. So these are allegations that the plaintiff is making. And this is the plaintiff's words. And they're making these allegations that this is what they intend to prove in the lawsuit. So the difference between that and an affidavit would be an affidavit would, would, would be signed by a witness or one of the parents saying that they're affirming to all these things. Right. And this is just the third amended complaint, just so that. Right. But isn't this complaint is clear. based off of an affidavit or, no. or that, a statement that Roberta and, 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 uh, well, they've amended it based on what they said at their deposition to allege these things as facts in their complaint, but this is not a sworn to document so, by right. the laundries. So then they can come back and say, well, we really didn't say this. Well, you can read, you know, they'll read the testimony, like at a trial, they would read the testimony in quest, question, answer, question, answer. And they would say, well, yeah, th he told me that that Gabby was gone, but I didn't know that that meant dead. I thought that meant she left. She okay. split. She got mad at me and ran away. I don't know where she is. You know, they could explain that a lot of different ways. And it's going to be up to a jury to decide what they knew or didn't know and what yeah. was meant by gone. Yeah. So these are so these are all sworn and signed um, no. depositions. And so there would have been follow up questions to that that we don't see in here in this complaint, amended complaint. Right. You know, well, what did he? Well, why did he need a lawyer? If this what is God? If you didn't believe God went dead, then why did he need a lawyer? And and what did you do after he said that? What advice did you give your son? None of that information is in here. No, because so, this is just a complaint. This is a pleading right. filed by the plaintiff about right. what they think they can prove. Um, the deposition transcripts, if we had that, we could read it and Absolutely. see what other questions were answer, asked and answered. But we don't right. have that. Would be huge. I wonder if those are available, because if they are, I'd love to read them. But, but I'd have to say that this is this is from probably the wording in this is not just, they didn't just choose it to make it sound good. This has to come from some something that they swore to some some type of well if you look at the second amended complaint and you compare it with the third amended complaint then you'll see what's different and then you'll see that some of these allegations that they're now making were things that they have gleaned from the depositions that they said were held in october right. so that's where they came from but um you know they testified under oath but again there's lots of other questions and answers that we don't have access to right now right Right. So I'm going to link all this stuff in the description. If anybody has any other information, just send it to me on dutyround.com. Uh, I just want to ask you guys, if you have not yet subscribed, please consider subscribing. Giving this video a thumbs up for Ed and I, and also make sure you go over to Melanie Little's channel, which I'll link down below in the description and subscribe to her as well. She does live streams all the time and she's on with you guys uh, reading complaints reading um you know lots of things out and interacting with you guys and that's what's great about her is that she makes herself available and and and, and she engages really well with her audience and i don't know where she learned that from but i know that she was paying attention oh so, you <laughs> uh, so um here's one coming in from lauren she says what about ethics new york state bar for bertolino He's had trouble, I, I understand, mm -hmm. over the time, over the course of time, but I don't know. What do you what do you think, Melanie? I mean, somebody somebody could certainly make a complaint against him. That would be a complaint that would have to be made with the bar association. Yeah. And they would take and it from it there. Would get, it would get investigated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. This whole thing smells really bad and it really is not a good look for the uh, laundry family. Um and and, and and again, this is from the beginning to the end they're being really really shitty about this and you know i feel so horrible for gabby petito's family the petito and schmidt family are doing what they can to try to fight domestic violence they have the gabby petito foundation which i'll link in the description uh, we have donated thousands of dollars to the gabby petito foundation on behalf of this whole community Ed, when we went there, we handed them a check for a thousand bucks. You and I, um, they're 
they're trying to keep their daughter's name alive and do the right thing to help other people so that it doesn't happen to other people. And that's that's really great. And they're also looking to support search groups like EquiSearch and all these dive teams that are out there. And they're trying to support people who search for the missing. And that is phenomenal. And by the way, just so I have you, when I have you guys here, I want you to know Sunday, this Sunday, we're going to have former Adventures with Purpose diver Nick Rin. He's the diver who found Kylie Rodney. Um, and he's going to come on on Sunday in the afternoon. Ed and I are going to interview him. And we're going to talk about his new search uh, and dive uh, rescue group. Uh, he's got a lot of great information to put out, and that's going to be 1 o'clock on Sunday afternoon, a little Sunday matinee. What do you think, Ed? I don't know. Um, I'm, uh, I'm going to be in the uh, D.C. metro area. Well, you're going to have to use a satellite and somehow put a backpack on and get in. But uh, it'll be just me and Nick. It'll be fine. If Ed can't make it, it's, it's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll have a good time. It's going to be on Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. So everybody, if you're you know following uh, Nick and some of the things, and you know, again, he was, he was the diver who found Kylie Rodney in her car in the, in the water in California. So um, he's going to come on and join us. But I want to thank Melanie and Ed, obviously, for taking out an hour at a time on a Tuesday night. Ed's traveling. He's in Colorado. Melanie just did an hour and a half hour, two hours live stream. So thank you so much, guys. We are going to follow this thing, and we're going to see how this develops. There's so much more that we'll hear about. The, the, the civil trial set for May of 2024, anything can happen between then. then. We heard Pat Riley say, if there's a settlement that is acceptable to us, we'll take it. And it, does that, I mean, is that what most civil attorneys look for, a decent settlement for their clients, and if they get it, rather than go through a long proceeding and so forth? Just, you never want to risk a case with a jury. You know, it's like, would you go in if there's say there's a, a half a million dollar offer on the table and it may not seem like a lot of money, but would you take a half a million dollars and throw it down on a roulette table in a casino and, you know, let it ride? Because that's what you're doing with a jury always. You know, they could come back with 10 times that amount. They could come back with zero. It's it's always a very risky thing. So if a settlement can be made, you know, over 90 percent of civil, civil cases settle and never see a trial. But if there is a trial, I will definitely be covering it because it will be televised just like the Kowalski case was televised. So I, we'll I like my odds with that Sarasota uh, court. Yeah, yeah, the 261 million. Yeah. And I want to get your final thoughts before we wrap up um, as it pertains to this civil case and the Petito family. I mean, again, you and I met them both in person. Um, I, think that, I think the Petito family is going to win. Um, I think they'll uh, most likely get a settlement. I think uh, they sunk themselves uh, with these depositions uh, and they, they couldn't lie. So the truth came out. And it's what we suspected, many of us suspected, was going on with this family. And now they're going to, or at least they'll get some semblance of um, civil justice uh, for uh, what the family had done um, to, the, to the Petitos. Yeah. And what they failed to do. And that was the right thing. They should have communicated with them and not blocked them. And this is just, just such really crummy behavior. And I'm being kind. I'm trying to be kind without, you know, getting all using the cursey words. So, but uh, again, as I always like to end these live streams, I, I want to send strength, prayers, and positive vibes to the Petitos and Schmitz and all of their friends and family and everyone that's affected by this. Not only the you know the petito and schmidt family but you know the law enforcement who were out there in that Colton reserve searching and risking their lives getting could, could, could have had disasters left and right eaten by alligators and all kinds of snakes and all kinds of craziness inside there so you know law enforcement is affected by it and and, and you know the moab police department they're getting sued uh um, um, and and um you know they they're under a lot of scrutiny those officers who responded are emotionally affected by what happened to Gabby. And I don't care how you guys slice it. I mean, I'm not uh, here, standing here trying to fully defend them, but they also have feelings too. And they, they, they feel horrible about what happened. And I, and I read articles. As a matter of fact, I think one of them actually left the job. It's not no longer on the job because of the emotional 
you know, um, on all the distress that they're, they're experiencing. So uh, it, it's not easy, guys. So uh, again, thank you to Ed for taking out the time and Melanie for being here with us. Um, there's a super chat coming in, Art for Life, Forensic Art. Thank you for the $50 super sticker. We greatly appreciate you. And we appreciate all the support. And I think we got to it all. Just want to make sure that we did quickly before we wrap up. Artist for Life has been a member for five months and she says thank you for always bringing us the best yeah i mean you know we try to do what we can we're just human beings and none of the stuff that we bring you is scripted we just try to wing it and go through it you know from the heart so thank you again for the support and on behalf of crime time with duty ron and ed wallace we're going to wish you guys a good night ed i know you got something to say before we end with the cop team that's right folks remember always um Stay safe, stay prepared, and watch your six. Thank you, Melanie. Is love you guys, replay viewers, the moderators, super chatters. You guys are awesome. Peace and love from Crime Time with Duty Ron and Ed and Melanie. Good night. Good night.